do that often. Look in their lives, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 You may be seated. For 539. 539. I will sing of my Redeemer. <laughs> Thank you. 
you, Brother Dawson. It feels good to have all these voices singing, even if uh, some of them are still struggling with the after effects of colds and sickness. It's good to have all these voices. And I was thinking in that last verse, when we'll be singing in harmony with the angels in heaven. What a multitude that will be, and what a, what a large chorus that will be. Can you only imagine? <laughs> some of those angels, when they spoke, it sounded like thunder, or sounded like a large trumpet and the earth would shake or heaven would shake and people would tremble. Can you imagine singing in that choir? How about that? That's what we've got to look forward to. If you have hope in Jesus Christ and your trust is in him, that's his promise to you. It's that, that, uh, that fellowship and that eternal worship and praise of our Father in heaven. Well, uh, praise the Lord. we got more people filtering back in from getting... Uh, Feeling better, and Brother Brian, praise the Lord, you're back home safe and had a good time and a good trip. Praise the Lord for that. And uh, I do thank everybody for the prayers for uh, uh, for the surgery. It went really well, and I must say that from where I'm standing, my eye surgery did you folks a lot of good. <laughs> yeah, <that's for> sure. <laughs> we aren't near, nearly the fuzzy-faced, dull, expressionless people that I've been used to here for a while. So, at any rate, uh, yeah. So praise the Lord for that. It went really well, and already sight is improving, so uh, thankful for that. Well, we've got lots of prayer requests, I know. We'll, take, we'll consider all those here at the end of service. We do have enough people here. We can have a business meeting that we put off last week just because there weren't a lot of people here, and uh, we skipped our business meeting from last month, so we'll have a short business meeting. At least I think it's going to be short. Uh, here uh, after after my lesson tonight. So let's go ahead and get started and we'll have uh, ask the Lord to bless our, our message and service tonight. Father, we do thank you and praise you, dear God, for the privilege to gather together in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and to have that hope and to be able to sing and to sing together, Lord, in a, in a unified voice and even harmonize together with the 
the voices you've given us and, and to, to sing of the hope that we have, to sing of uh, what you've done for us and the blessings the, that, uh, that you've showered upon us. And Father, we praise you for that. And we ask now that in this time, Lord, for in this assembly, that your, your spirit would work through us and in us, that we would uh, glean from your word, that we'd be encouraged by your word, and we would understand and see, Heavenly Father, the, the things that uh, you, you have for us tonight. And Father, that we'd be edified and lifted up and, and made stronger in the faith. Father, we praise you for those that uh, have returned after sickness. And Lord, we know there's others that are still suffering from sickness and the effects of it and we just pray that you bless them and strengthen them and give them health uh, speedy recovery lord and and uh, we praise you lord for those that are joining us on the live stream as well and just pray that you bless them and and uh, for their efforts to uh, while they're away to be able to still try to join us and, and receive uh, the, the the lesson here tonight as it's spoken we praise you for your goodness, dear Lord, and, and thank you for answered prayers, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Be seated. Well, I um, told you last week that uh, I'd like to begin a series of, of lessons in 1 Corinthians. We've studied 1 Corinthians here in the past. Uh, it's been a few years, and I don't think we went through the whole book uh, we went through different portions of it, but uh, uh, I'd like to go ahead and, and start that study with the, with the hope that as we go through it, that we will, um, not only will we glean from the specifics of it, but we'll also have an outlook. I, I told you my emphasis in the teaching at this time will be to take this text, but always have a, a view towards without. A lot of 1 Corinthians has to do with uh, the view within, you know, how we operate as a church, how we deal with problems as a church, the specific problems that came up in the church in Corinth and how that, that is to be dealt with. So there's a lot of, uh, you might say, uh, um, internal uh, perspective to the 1 Corinthians. But I'd like to try to take that and look outward if we can uh, and at least that's my hope as we go through this. But I want to start this evening by some introductory comments and just getting us a good understanding of that church in Corinth. Because I think if we understand and keep in our minds who the people were and what their backgrounds were in Corinth, we will be able to then apply this in an outward way. Because they, their situation uh, is, was not too different from where we're at today. Our situation today, we can find a lot of similarities with what they, what, with what Corinth was like. And um, I, I'd like to, for us to kind of get a feel for what it might have been like to, to be a member of that church, to kind of get an understanding for what it would have been like to be a member there, and to be a citizen of Corinth, to kind of understand the, the circumstances and the environment that they lived in. We, uh, we can go ahead and put up the maps here, and I'll turn this light off. So I just want to show you where Corinth is, because that's important to understanding the, the nature of the city and what all went on there. And uh, let's see if this works. Yeah, so there, if you can see, this is Italy. Rome is right up in there. I know it's really fuzzy, but that's, that's Rome right up there. This is the Isle of uh, Sicily, I believe. And of course, here's Israel over here, Jerusalem. This is Asia. Can't see it, but there's a little line of water going through there. That's the Straits of Bosporus, where Istanbul, Turkey is today. And before that, it was known as Constantinople. Uh, and that's kind of the the seedbed of Eastern Catholicism. That's where Eastern Catholicism rose out of to a great extent. Uh, so this is Asia Minor, or it's referred to as Asia in the book of Acts. You've got Ephesus, you've got Troas up here. And at Troas, that's where the Apostle Paul sought to go into Asia, back into Asia, and the Lord forbid him. He wanted to go over into um, uh, 
uh, Macedonia up into this area, and the Lord, the Holy Spirit forbade him. And so he, he went over into, uh, no, he got the Macedonian call. He wanted to go to Asia, and he wanted to go to, excuse me, to Bithynia. Bithynia is this area up here. I'm losing power on my little light here. But uh, so he went into Philippi, Macedonia. And the first person he met was Lydia, who happened to be of, I think she was from uh, one of the towns in Bithynia. So though he didn't get to go to that area, he met from someone who was from that area. But he worked his way down into Athens, which is uh, up in, he worked his way down to Athens, which is up in here. And then finally he came down into Corinth, which is that little skinny strait of land connecting this area, which is called the Peloponnese, and the rest of Greece. In early New Testament times, this was called Achaia. The churches of Achaia would be this area in here. Corinth would be one of the churches of Achaia. Sincrea, or Kencrea, as it's sometimes called, which is just on the other side of the strait, uh, of that isthmus was also one of the churches of Achaia. So let's go to the next slide. So, I'm sorry, let's go back. I got one more thing to say. So if you wanted to get from Rome to Athens, now, uh, Corinth was at this time a Roman colony. In about 140 BC, 144 BC or something like that, in that area, um, Corinth was almost destroyed by the Romans. It was uh, reduced almost to rubble. And then it was rebuilt. And so by about 40 AD, it was rebuilt. And the Apostle Paul was there in about 54 AD. So it was a pretty new city. It had been rebuilt and everything was pretty new and modern, if you will. And, but it had a lot of classical Greek architecture. And the Athens was the seat of, uh, uh, it was a city-state, but it was a powerful city-state, so there's a lot of interaction between Rome and Athens, okay? So if you wanted to get from Rome, you could sail around here, go through this little strait here, or go around Sicily, and come in, and you either had to go around the Peloponnese, which was a dangerous voyage, it was actually down in here, and, and uh, coming out of this, the Fair Havens, going over into Malta, where the Apostle Paul, on his when he was being transported to Rome uh, later on, that's where he they ran into to storms and shipwreck in and, and that area here, on the, and shipwreck on the Isle of Malta. So this was a <coughs> troublesome area. So they could sail through here and cut through this little passage, park the ship there in Corinth. And there was actually a road made with, with uh, trolleys on it where they could drag the boat, off, you know, offload the boat, drag the boat a couple of miles across the isthmus, put it back in the water, reload it, and, and then the sailors could get back on and then sail right on around into Athens. It was faster. To do all of that was faster than to sail that extra dangerous trek around in here to get up to all these islands and get up into... Uh, up into Athens. So it was a real fertile area. It was on a trade route. There was also overland trade routes coming from Athens across that skinny little area. There was a wall built uh, for, uh, to, for defenses to defend the Peloponnese. You've probably heard of the Peloponnesian Wars. Uh, there was a wall built across there to, to fortify this whole area over there. So. Uh, it was a strategic place. Now we can go to the next slide. And this is a this is a, a blow up of that same area. So there you can see that little isthmus. There's Corinth. There's Sincrea right next to it. So these churches were really close together. There's Athens, not far away. So they could even offload here and go overland into Athens at that point and turn their ships around uh, right here at Corinth. So they had a lot of uh, uh, value. And this, like I said, this whole region here is called the Peloponnese Peninsula, and it was referred to in the Bible as the region of Achaia. And we can go one more, and you can see a little bit here what Corinth was like. 
The old town of Corinth was up here near this mountain. At the base of this mountain, there were large fertile fields in here. They could grow all kinds of crops, uh, temperate climate. And uh, this is that, that wall that I was talking about, went across here. And th they had that road, and I can't pronounce it. I think it's the Theopica uh, the or something like that. But that road went across, and that's where they could transport ships and goods from one from the Gulf of Corinth to the Saronic Gulf. And they could continue on their journey all the way over into Asia, crossing over in there. Uh, later on, they began to build a canal. Uh, under Roman rule, they started building a canal across there. And I think it was in 1858 the canal was finally finished. <laughs> but it's a huge, deep canal deep, deep gorge going through rock. And, but th there is a canal there, and, and they can take ships. I don't know how big the ships can be, but I saw some photographs of pretty large ships, not the super tankers of today, but uh, at least some pretty large ships can go through that canal today and get from one side to the other. So even today, it's a, an area of strategic importance. So. This area, at the time the Apostle Paul first went there, he had been in Athens and uh, was rejected uh, for the most part in Athens. And he worked his way down into Achaia and, and went to Corinth. Um, it was a Roman colony, so Paul as a Roman citizen, was free to move about there. Uh, they, they did speak Greek uh, and... Um, it was, an, it was in a time of rapid growth, and there happened to be a large Jewish population there. And I'll, we'll see why if we turn to Acts chapter 18. Let's go to Acts chapter 18, and we're going to uh, read a good portion of Acts chapter 18 tonight. Uh, beginning in verse 1, Acts chapter 18 and verse 1. After these things, Paul departed from Athens and came to Corinth and found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, lately come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because that Claudius had commanded all Jews to depart from Rome, and then the end of parentheses, and came unto them. So Paul came unto Aquila and Priscilla. So when Paul arrived in Corinth, he happened to meet these two, this couple that were Jews that had lived in Italy, in Rome, and we find them later on back in Rome, but at this point they had left Rome. They had been kicked out of Rome because Claudius Caesar kicked all of the Jews out of Rome. And so a great many of them, this being en route, this being on a trade route, a shipping route from Rome to Corinth, and then boats would offload there and people could go overland into Athens or get on another boat on the other side and go on to Asia or back to Jerusalem. A lot of Jews just ended up right there in Corinth. It was the stopping point. And so Aquila and Priscilla happened to be there at that time. Happened to be there, right? Isn't it amazing how God works? Aquila and Priscilla. God put Aquila and Priscilla in Paul's life at this point. And they became instrumental in, in working with Paul and doing a great many uh, in mission endeavors, traveling from here to Ephesus, from Ephesus, uh, and we find them again in Rome. Uh, so they were a couple that moved around quite a bit, helping Paul in the ministry. But this is where they met. And so there were many shops there, lots of trade. Aquila and Priscilla, what we read here, and verse 3, and because he was of the same craft, he abode with them and wrought, for by their occupation they were tent makers. So Aquila and Priscilla were tent makers. Paul had that occupation as well. And so he had that trade, that craft. He knew how to do that. And so he worked with them. Now, he ended up living in Corinth for about a year and a half at this time. The population of Corinth at this time was bigger than that of Anchorage. I know for us, you know, we say Anchorage, bigger than Anchorage. Wow, that's huge. But uh, a lot of other people, especially when we'd go to Ghana, and, and I would tell them, uh, 
um, they, they would ask about Alaska and what it was like, and I'd say, well, you can put about five Ghanas inside the state of Alaska, and we've got less than a million people. We've got maybe, I think we might be up to 700,000 now or thereabouts, and half of them live in Anchorage, you know, one city. And for them, that was just hard for them to fathom, 35 million people in the country of Ghana, and, and, and it was about one-fifth the size of Alaska, and, uh, you know, the, the density of people there is, is pretty dense, even though they do have open countryside, but uh, Corinth was maybe twice as large as uh, Anchorage as far as population. So it was a bustling town. It was a big, big and bustling town. It was a melting pot, too, because it's a coastal town, so there's many transients, as we've already seen. There were a lot of Jews there. There were Romans there because it was a, a Roman colony and, of course, Greeks that had come down. And, and so a uh, pretty good mix of uh, cultures, but also with that, the Romans allowed a lot of these false gods to be worshipped, so it was a polytheistic community. There were a lot of different religions represented in Corinth, a lot of different gods that were set up on pedestals, a lot like Athens, where they had a god on every street corner, and just in case they missed one, they had a monument to the unknown god. And so uh, Corinth was very similar, had a lot of uh, gods there. It was, um, they valued intellectual life above moral life. Uh, they valued the present, present pleasures, pleasant uh, living life for now without restraint. They valued that above planning for the future or being thinking about what the effects of all of this might be on your life in the future. I, we can relate to that in our society today. I think as I go through describing Corinth, you should be able to start picking up on things that uh, we see similarities with this, these very same thoughts or these very same conditions in the world today. A lot of people thinking for the moment, not thinking about the effects, the consequences of uh, their actions, what that's going to do to them. And so uh, drinking and sensuality were very prevalent. Of course, it was a, a port city. Uh, sailors, uh, when their ships docked, and if they had to wait for their ship to be unloaded and then drug across the peninsula and put back in the water, what do sailors do when they have no time and they uh, are no work responsibilities and they're hanging out in port? Well, it became a very immoral town. And in fact, there was a common phrase or word in Greek that is the Corinthia Zomai uh, that became... Uh, Literally, it means to act the Corinthians, but it became a byword for fornication. And so Corinth had a reputation. And this is what Paul found when he came to Corinth. This, he didn't come to some place that was pious. He came to a Wild West kind of port town that was up and coming, booming a metropolis, people from all over, a bustling, hustling city with lots of trade, Lots of um, agriculture nearby, a rich area, and lots of people there that had nothing to do but get in trouble. And so this is where what, what Paul came to when he came there to uh, Corinth. But this is what the church, and this is where I want us to focus on a little bit. This is the kind of, the, those kinds of people, the people that lived in uh, and among that sort of thing, the people that saw this, there was a temple on the hillside behind Corinth that had uh, uh, on top of the hill that is reported to have had a thousand temple prostitutes that plied their trade in that place all the time. And this is the sort of thing that out of that culture, out of that environment, out of that, the home life of people raised up in that sort of thing, that's the people that were saved, came to know the Lord Jesus Christ, gathered together as a church, and they began to function as a church of the Lord Jesus Christ, began to step out of all of the unrighteousness, all of the wicked traditions, all of the wicked feasts and celebrations and customs, and all of the things that they did, 
they had to turn from that to serve the Lord Jesus Christ in righteousness and in holiness and in sanctification. I mean, you can start to see the similarities in, in the way our world is today and the immorality that's so prevalent and the, the, especially in the United States of America, the things that we tolerate and the things that are even promoted. And yet when somebody is saved out of that, we can say, well, you know, we can see and we can know that, yes, they're going to have to overcome a lot of things. There's mind uh, thought processes that are going to have to change and that we work together as a church to overcome that and help them or, or make sure that, that uh, as a church we don't get drawn down into that sort of thing as well. So a lot of the problems that we read about in Corinth that had to be addressed were they stemmed from that culture that this church had risen up out of. And so they had to, they had to fight against that, uh, the influence of that culture as a church. So let's go back to Acts chapter 18, and we'll continue reading in verse 4. We saw that he was uh, working with Aquila and Priscilla. And in verse 4 it says, And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, and persuaded the Jews and the Greeks. And when Silas and Timotheus were come from Macedonia, Paul was pressed in the spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus was Christ. And when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, he shook his raiment and said unto them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And he departed thence and entered into a certain man's house named Justice, one that worshipped God, whose house joined hard to the synagogue. And Crispus, the chief ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all his house. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, believed and were baptized. Then spake the Lord to Paul in the night by a vision, Be not afraid, but speak, and hold not thy peace, for I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee, for I have much people in this city. And he continued there a year and six months, teaching the word of God among them. And we'll stop there for just a minute. I just want to point out that uh, he was there a year and a half, and he was working, uh, and as he often did, he traveled with a group of people. We see here that, uh, in particular that Silas and Timotheus. Silas was a member of the church there in Antioch that uh, was traveling with, with uh, <coughs> Paul and been sent out of the church in Antioch. Timothy was, had been picked up along the way at Derby and had joined them now. We see these two coming in after Paul uh, and joining him there in the work. And Paul teaches to the Jews... Gospels off, offered to the Jew first and then the Gentile, and the Jews rejected him. And so he says, I go to the Gentiles. And I find it interesting here that uh, uh, Justice is, um, he worshiped God and his house joined hard to the synagogue. It appears that he was a Gentile. But, uh, but then we see that Crispus, a chief ruler of the synagogue, believes. And many of the Corinthians heard and believed. Sometimes we can look at people or look at the circumstances that they're in and say, these people, are they're not going to accept the gospel. They're not going to believe. They're, they're too seeped in sin. They're, they're, these are sinners, terrible sinners, and they're not going to receive the gospel. We've got here a good example that in Corinth, the, apostle, uh, the Lord told the apostle Paul, you don't hold your peace. You keep preaching the gospel. Because I have many people in this town, and many Corinthians believed. Many pe people heard the words and the hope of the gospel, even though they had all the pleasures of sin before them, and they'd been living with that. That's the thing about sin. After a while, it kills you. And people living in sin after a while can get very, very tired of it, but they don't know what to do. They don't know where to go. They don't, know where th they, they don't have hope. And when that hope is presented, the Lord told the Apostle Paul, you don't hold your peace. You speak, because I've got many people here, and those people heard the word, and they were saved. That's an encouragement. And also, I, he says in verse 10, For I am with thee, and no man shall set on thee to hurt thee. He had already been run out of uh, towns, hadn't he? Out of uh, uh, Ephesus, and out of uh, uh, Philippi, and 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 by the Jews, and the Lord told him here, 
you're going to be okay. Nobody's going to hurt you here. And many people are going to believe. You know, I think every missionary would hope to hear something like that as he goes to an area. Nobody's going to hurt you. You're going to be fine. You speak. You speak the gospel. Don't hold back because I've got a lot of people here in this town. What an encouragement. I can only imagine how the apostle would be encouraged in, in hearing that and how this church then, as, as they assembled, as people began to be saved and they began to assemble, how that would have been a very dear church to the Apostle Paul. That, that church would have had a very special place in his heart because of knowing what he knew about their circumstances, knowing what he had been promised by the Lord. This is a God-promised church that uh, I know the Lord has established you and put you here in this place uh, without a doubt because he told me so, that, that he had a, a many people here and you are that many people. That church in Corinth would be that many people. And I can only imagine how that would have been an encouragement to the Apostle Paul. We'll keep reading here in uh, verse 12. When Gallio was the deputy of Achaia, the Jews made insurrection with one accord against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat. Ah, he still goes to the judgment seat, right? Saying, this fellow persuadeth men to worship God contrary to the, to the law. And when Paul was now about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, if it, were a, if it were a matter of wrong or wicked lewdness, O ye Jews, reason would that I should bear with you. I, can't, I can only wonder what, they, what their definition of wicked lewdness would be in a town like Corinth. I, maybe it was not using the right pronoun or something like that. I don't know. But in verse 15, but if it be a question of words and names and of your law, look ye to it, for I will be no judge of such matters. And he drave them from the judgment seat. Then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the chief ruler of the synagogues, and beat him before the judgment seat. And Gallio cared for none of those things. So Paul was protected. The Lord put Gallio on his side. Uh, kept the, the Jews from uh, bringing harm to Paul. But he was able to stay there for a year and a half. But after he left Corinth, others came through. So there was, when he left, there was a church that was now maybe a year, year and a half old, that was beginning to, uh, to grow and was young, had a lot of obstacles to overcome. And so the Lord sent other people there. If we go to Acts chapter 18 and verse 24, and a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexandria, Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the scriptures came to Ephesus. And so we meet Apollo back over here in Asia at Ephesus. This man was instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in the spirit, he spake and taught diligently the things of the Lord knowing only the baptism of John. And he began to speak boldly in the synagogue, whom when Aquila and Priscilla, now in Acts chapter, in the earlier part of Acts chapter 18, we met them in Corinth, right? Now we meet the same couple in Asia, in Ephesus. When Aquila and Priscilla had heard, they took him unto them and expounded unto him the way of God more perfectly. Then when he was disposed to pass into Achaia, where is Achaia? That's where Corinth is. Yeah, that's that Peloponnese Peninsula. He was disposed, Apollos was disposed to pass into Achaia. The brethren wrote, so this would be the brethren in Ephesus, wrote the disciples to receive him. So the brethren in, in Ephesus knew of the brethren in Corinth. And so Apollos said, I want to go to Corinth. And they, the, so he was given a letter of recommendation. Okay, that's really, that's what this letter is. It's a letter commending him. Who, when he was come, when he came to Corinth, helped them much which had believed through grace, for he mightily convinced the Jews, and that publicly, showing by the scriptures that Jesus was Christ. You know, the apostle Paul was there, and he spoke boldly, telling the Jews that Jesus was Christ, and after a year and a half, you know, he, after some time, he went over to the Gentiles because he was rejected. Apollos comes along a year and a half, maybe two years later, and 
he is able, he is eloquent enough and knowledgeable of the scriptures so that he is able to do what the Apostle Paul couldn't do. He convinced the Jews in public. He was able to stand up against those Jews with his speech. This is an eloquent man, a powerful speaker. You can only imagine how influential a man like that would be. So he was one that came through Corinth after Paul left. There was another um, there are others that came through as well. And so these believers had come from a wide variety of background. They had evidently come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and been baptized. But one of the problems that we face early on, if we go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1 now, one of the things that we face early on is that the differing backgrounds, the differing exposures that they had to the gospel, the, the, the very individuals that brought the gospel to them and that baptized them became a point of division in this church. We're going to read here next week, Lord willing, when we get into this, uh, it, 1 Corinthians 1.12, it says, Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of, uh, I am of Paul, I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, or of Peter, and I of Christ. So some of these people in church in Corinth had actually seen Jesus Christ and actually been converted during his ministry. And others had uh, seen and heard and been converted under the ministry of uh, the Apostle Peter. And Apollos had been influential and some of Paul. And so, and who they had received their baptism by became a point of contention as well. This... Uh, this church wrestled with many temptations. They were inundated by worldly philosophies and cultural practices that were contrary to Christ. And when Paul was at Ephesus, if we go to 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 11, some bad news came to him while he was there. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. You know, he left this group in Corinth. He goes to Ephesus, and the word that he gets is the church has fallen apart. The church is, there's divisions, there's sin, there's wickedness. Uh, they're not dealing with, with some of the sin that's in the church. I mean, you know, this, I can only imagine how that was heavy on his heart, knowing that the Lord said, I have many in this town. And then he leaves, he felt led of the Lord to leave Corinth. He gets to Ephesus and he hears the church has got some serious troubles. And so that's the purpose of the writing of this letter. That's why the Apostle Paul wrote them and gave them such direct instruction. He had already written to them. If we go to uh, chapter 5 and verse 9, we read about another letter that previous to this, evidently, that the Apostle had written, chapter 5 and verse 9. We read, I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators. What letter that was, we don't know. He wrote a letter to them, and uh, we don't have record of it here. The Lord chose not to preserve it. Uh, it's, it's not part of the, the canon of Scripture. And so... We don't have it, but we have reference to it. And um, the, the church responded back with some questions, and there was some news that came back. And so the apostle is, part of this letter is response to some of the concerns they had, particularly about the resurrection. We read that they had some serious concerns about the resurrection. And so Paul addressed that specifically. When we consider the topics that uh, are addressed in this letter, we see that this church was faced with many issues. And for many of these issues, they were not dealing with them well. Uh, they had lost their, their direction. They had lost their compass. They, had, they didn't have the spiritual maturity to be able to sort some things out. They had immorality. They had immodesty that had crept into the church. There were divisions based on personalities. 
People were taking each other to court rather than working out their differences amongst each other. There were differences of opinion and some false teaching about marriage. There were some differences of opinion and practice on, on the idea of women's head coverings, uh, on divorce and remarriage, and misunderstandings regarding spiritual gifts and the Lord's Supper. Can we have any of that today in our church? We can have any and all of that, right? These sorts of things, depending on who comes into our church, they come in with their ideas, what they've been taught, what they may have as misunderstandings. They can come into our church and we have to then start to instruct them. But if we don't instruct out of the word of God like we should, next thing we know, we've got this hodgepodge of ideas and we've got this... Um, alphabet soup, if you will, of different doctrines and ideas floating around all within the same body. And one of the first topics that the Apostle Paul addresses in this letter is unity. Unity. Taking care of the divisions that he had heard about. Mending those divisions. In all of these topics we're going to read about and in all of them um, we'll get good instruction from the Lord and not only that, we'll also be instructed on the nature and actions of love. You had a a good lesson about love. Brother Smoot brought a lesson on uh, 1 Corinthians 13 while I was away. And uh, also we'll get a great instruction about our great hope in the resurrection and what we have to look forward to in that. I hope I've given enough of a feel that we can see this is relevant. This is an ancient history. These are things we deal with today. These are things that, uh, topics that still come up. I mean, these very same questions uh, I, I've encountered by people here in Alaska, by people in Russia, by people in Africa, by people, uh, you know, in the lower 48. These, these questions are still out there. But the instruction is here. We just need to receive it. And we need to understand it in context. I think that's probably the hardest thing about the answers that the apostle gave, that a lot of people take the answers and then take them out of context. They take it out of the context of the church setting for which it was intended to the church of God, which is at Corinth, and they try to apply it in ways that it wasn't intended, and we get misunderstandings. And so uh, we'll keep things in context and try to apply this in a way that's going to make us better ambassadors for Christ, not only in how we govern ourselves as a body and, and how, what is taught within this body, but how that affects what we're going to do in the world, carrying forth the commission that's been given to us. All right, well, we'll close with that. And uh, 1 Corinthians is, a, it seems straightforward. It seems like it just gives cut and dried answers, but actually it's a rather difficult uh, book to study. And so we'll, we'll, we'll chew on it. We'll, we'll chew our way through it, okay? All right, Lord willing. All right, well, let's, uh, I'd like to go ahead and close now with a word of prayer, and uh, 